Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. Well, in this episode of Behind the Music, we're joined by Ryan Stickney, who is a member of the alto section of the Houston Chamber Choir. Ryan, welcome. Thank you Thank for joining us. You. Thanks. It's an honor to speak with you, Sinjin. When did you join the choir? I joined the Chamber Choir in 2011, right after I got back from grad school in Boston. I came back down to Houston, where I had lived for quite a long time uh, before I went to get my master's and decided I wanted to do professional music after finishing some music grad school. Now, you did your undergraduate at Rice University. Yes, I did. If I'm not mistaken, you were a voice major at the Shepherd School at Rice, is that correct? Yeah, I double majored in voice and linguistics. So it took me five ah. years, but I got two degrees and they are pretty catalytic to each other. I, I learned a lot of phonetics and phonology and the way to pronounce things. And I had already done a lot of IPA in high school because I went to high school for singing as well. Uh, that's at the HSPBA. International Phonetic Alphabet. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so they give a lot to each other, the linguistics degree and the voice degree. Um, it was more of a, a sort of all round voice degree than the Shepherd School gives now. At that point, there was still a range of vocal ensembles that you could participate in as a voice major. And there was an, even uh, an, an early music group, which uh, was run by some of the musicologists on the faculty. And I deeply enjoyed that. Do you remember when you auditioned for the chamber choir, do you remember what you prepared, what you sang? It might have been the same thing I auditioned for Rice with, actually it might have been Schubert die Neugierige, um, but I'm not entirely sure. 2011 then, what have been the highlights for you as a member of the choir since you joined? The first rehearsal, honestly, has stuck in my mind even to now. I had such a wash of ensemble-loving relief when we were sight-reading some palestrina. It was the, the first concert of the season was frequently um, Renaissance music. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I belonged there. We were reading palestrina and I got shivers and goosebumps from the feeling of having everyone around me so invested in expressing all of the depths of this very old but also very intense music. Another highlight I suppose would be the first time um, the chamber choir did one of my arrangements. I was sort of trying not to vibrate off the stage as I both got to listen to them do my arrangement of Bohemian Rhapsody and also saying the lead mm. myself, which freaks me out every time I think about it. It's such a pleasure to do that Channeling song. your own Freddie Mercury. Oh yes, if I can. He's yes. one of a kind, but we try. What's it like for you being a member of the choir? What is it that you derive from the choir? One of the most important things in my life, honestly, which is a sense of musical communion that you can't get from anything but a vocal ensemble. It even, even a big choir is not the same thing. When you have that range of, you know, six to 30 singers in a room together, and they are all completely concentrating on producing a piece that is specifically written or arranged for that kind of ensemble, there's, there's this really literally visceral sense of togetherness because you, it's, in your, it's in your abdomen, it's in your guts, you're breathing together. And that's so intensely life affirming to have that sense of making the same choices and having the same feelings as these other people at the same time in the service of this musical ideal that you're trying to reach together. And, you know, performance is one thing and it's very important that you also present it to someone. But really what I love is how it feels when you're all together and that can be in rehearsal when you're trying very hard to get one specific thing exactly right, exactly together or when you're 
making decisions about how it's going to go and how we're all going to come together to make this sound as good as it can be um, and and express what lies in the music. It's just, it can be overwhelming and there's nothing else like it. And that's what has, that's what drew me to the chamber choir in the first place. And that is why I continue to love singing with it. Talking to people, um, as I have been doing for these behind the music episodes, one of the things that I think comes across from everybody is that the choir engenders a great sense of community. Yeah. You, you feel that? I do. And I, I have, for basically my entire life, um, even before I was really in choirs, my mother is also a singer. Um, and she has been a complete fanatic about a fairly famous small vocal ensemble that you may have heard of called the King Singers um, <laughs> for a very long time, since the 70s. Um, and I was raised basically on the King Singers recordings. And there's a, there's a Beatles cover album that the King Singers have done. And mm -hmm. all of those Beatles songs, I learned from that album and not from the originals. Um, <laughs> as a three-year-old singing along to Lady Madonna, all of that. And it, it gave me such an important sense of what it's like to sing together because obviously they're an extremely high caliber and they have been this whole time mm -hmm. and i just internalized that and osmoted the desire to just be like that with other people and other singers um to the point that it was a total no-brainer when i was in middle school to be in the choir um it wasn't quite like the King singers of course uh, but it was that real community and sense of a shared goal um which you also find in theater when people are are attacking a, a an artistic or narrative problem together and everybody has something to contribute which is also um a very sort of healthy feeling to have when you're when you're pursuing an artistic goal you you mm -hmm. you're making a difference and you're making other people feel good and you're making yourself feel good it's a i don't know it's a there's nothing like a choir or a cast for a sense of just complete artistic hedonism and i roll in it and and try and bring everybody else with me which is very important for the for the sense of community like you have to have Everybody else has to feel as good about it as you do, or it's not, um, it's not as good as it could be. And I really want it to be that good. And I don't know, an emotional goal. Like it's, it's not just a craft. It's not just technical achievement. It's the, those are, are for the purpose of expressing a piece of music and the intentions of either the composer or the arranger or the director, um, everybody gets some say. Um, mm -hmm. But as a singer in an ensemble with other singers, you get to be one instrument together as much as you can. And that's such like I've never experienced that kind of community in any other pursuit. You were involved in the theatre when you were at Rice, weren't you? Yeah, I sure was. The first show that I ever did, I was a sophomore, um, was Bat Boy, which is difficult to explain. Uh, but it's the only show that I've ever heard of that was based on a tabloid issue. Um, I won't summarize the plot, but it's extremely campy and extremely fun. And I made some friends in it that I have kept the whole time. Um, I, I'm still very, very good friends with the man who played Bat Boy at the time. Uh, and were you, were you acting or were you? Um, I was acting. Technically yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I was a, it's a musical and I sang and acting and, um, and that gave me some connection to the campus theater culture, which I think is different now, but at the time there was a show that was, uh, produced, directed, acted, teched and everything 
by students at at every residential college at Rice, pretty much one per semester. So mm. 10 or 15 shows every semester. Um, and then I had friends who did college theater and I, my best friend at Rice was ambitious to direct some shows. Um, and he sort of took me along for the ride as his music director. So I music directed a bunch more shows after that, including um, Jesus Christ Superstar, which, boy, wow. that was an experience. That's, mm -hmm. I, I still think that's one of the best things I've ever done. Um, and Hair mm -hmm. with the same direction, that was also very intense to do. Um, and Cabaret, which was maybe intense in a different way. It certainly feels relevant now. Um, but for, for Cabaret in particular, I, I wasn't in it necessarily, but I was on stage with the band and we had, you know, it was a stage band, so we were all in costume. So I got to pull a few Cabaret moves. And I loved that sort of genre and aesthetic so much that I, uh, for my, for my, what I called my super senior recital, which was my fifth year recital, um, my teacher let me do a cabaret recital in which I did a bunch of fairly appropriate French art songs and English art songs and American art songs in a cabaret style, either down a fifth or just, you know, jazzified to coin a term. And then the last show that I did at Rice was one that I wrote um, called Vehicular Justices, which was about a traveling courtroom spaceship. Um, it's sort of a, a legal drama, crime show, sci-fi space opera. Uh, and it was just so fun to create that and have it produced um, and participate in it at my last year at Rice. Um, and I had so many friends who had been doing theater with me the whole time. It was, oh, it was such a joy. I very much miss um, theatrical productions in general and that one in particular. Maybe I should do it again. Now you have actually provided some uh, sets for uh, the Chamber oh, yeah. Choir performances. That's true. I forgot about that. I, uh, I, I paint as well and uh, I made a big old castle for the Minotti show that required a castle, the Conan Gorgon and Manticore. I still have that. It's an eight by four piece of plywood. And you built it and painted it and everything. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Got some, some house paint from the Oops shelf at Lowe's and painted a big castle on a piece of plywood. Wow. You did something as well for the uh, performances of Annalise. Is that correct? Oh yeah, I did. That was a very different experience. Um, not just because it was a different kind of painting, but also the story. So it's so real and it's so well expressed by that music. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost a theatrical performance in itself. Uh, I know the soloist had a little bit of staging. Um, she had a desk and a little bit of blocking, but uh, to be involved in setting the tone was a big honor. The choir were, were also in costume as well. Yes, it was only things that we already had, but we did try to dress um, for the time. Mm -hmm. it, it's amazing to think that being a member of the chamber choir, um, there is a, a tremendous amount of theatricality involved as well, isn't there? It's not just a question of standing there and singing your heart out. No, although that is also a valid pursuit. Um, I mm -hmm. don't mean to say that theater is the superior art. Um, no. There is, there's so much to be gained, um, actually, I find from standing in one place and singing and, and, and focusing um, just exclusively on the sound that, that comes from such an ensemble. Of course, visual expression is very important and you don't want people to fall off the wagon and get bored. Um, right. But if you're doing your job as a singer, hopefully they won't because they'll be so invested in your sound. I've been to 
a lot of choir and vocal ensemble concerts in my life. And I find that the ones that leave the biggest impression on me are the ones where I have to close my own eyes because I have to listen harder. Um, and it's just as well not to distract if the performance and the repertoire is such that it doesn't require a theatrical performance. Um, I do, I mean, basically, I love it either way. And of course, if there wasn't that um, engaging theatricality on a CD, right. you, uh, you wouldn't have won the Grammy. Presumably not. I, uh, I do still think about those recording sessions. We weren't all on stage for all of them because obviously some of them are men only and some of them are women only. And I remember uh, lying on the floor of the organ hall at Rice, uh, listening to the men do a couple takes before they started recording their uh, men only mass piece and thinking it's like we're in another world this is this is a place where there's only beauty and peace and calm and mm. of course I had my eyes closed and it absolutely didn't matter what they looked like and it still doesn't because it turns out the CD captured that quality and I still feel that way about the recording. Do you have some favorite pieces that uh, you've performed with the choir? That's perhaps an unfair question, but, but you know, pieces that, uh, that stick out in your mind and, uh, and you can't easily erase them from your mind, shall we say? I was very pleased to be able to do anything of Caroline Shaw's. Um, because I'm a huge fan of her work, both just her own recordings and with Roomful of Teeth. Um, my, my, my other vocal pursuits besides ensemble singing are in slightly out there avant-garde nonsense. That's what I went to grad school for. Um, and, and she is a she is a contemporary American composer that is yes that, that is avant-garde, shall we say. Yeah, I feel like that label is meaningless now because it was coined at a time when the word modernism was, what's modern now anyway, and what's what's on the cutting edge? What is mm -hmm. avant-garde? Um, but it's, 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 uh, it's weird and forward-thinking and extremely compelling and I have loved everything of hers that I've ever heard and everything that Roomful of Teeth has performed that I've ever heard. Um, That's a wonderful name for an ensemble, isn't it? I know, especially a vocal ensemble. Right. Um, and that sort of playfulness with convention is mm -hmm. very important to me as a, an improviser and a composer. And I just was so inspired by their debut album um and i was really excited to be able to get, get to do one of her pieces in the chamber choir um i mean of course also what i've mentioned it before but another thing that sticks out to me is to be able to do bohemian rhapsody with the chamber choir and what a solo there's just so much i loved the kareem alzan's piece he's a His... composer at the shepherd school of rice oh yeah he is um mm. and i had him for uh, tonal counterpoint when I went there. Uh, he was one of my favorite teachers. But I didn't know about his vocal writing. Um, and I talked to him about it a little bit afterwards. Um, and he says, obviously, you know, he wrote it 15 years ago. He would do it very differently now. But I just loved the pieces. They were so vocally intuitive and just so dexterously beautiful. He had so much to say with every mm. single moment and every single part. And it was all completely necessary for, for the total expression um, of, of the poems that he chose to set, which are also just mind blowingly beautiful. Um, that stands out to me a lot. Um, and another thing that I really loved that we did in the chamber choir uh, was the collaboration that we had with Christian McBride and his trio because it had been a long time since I had done any jazz. Um, this was a couple years ago and it was such a, a 
a kind of relief to to relax back into that uh, method, that world of of rehearsal and execution where you trust everybody because you know that they're going to accomplish exactly what they need to, and then you can figure it out together in rehearsal. And it's mm -hmm. just you're all extremely competent and extremely literate, and you know you you intuit each other's meaning in in that extremely chill jazz way. I loved working with him. Um, and I was so honored to be able to do um, a solo with his trio as well. Um, but I loved the piece that he had with us. It's just, oh, it was so beautiful. I loved that. But there's something in almost every season that we've done that I just, my mind has been blown right off by because Bob chooses such amazing repertoire. Um, yeah. I hope that someday we get to do um, the Rachmaninoff on Light Vigil, which was planned for last season that we didn't get to do because that's one of my favorite pieces in the world. Um, but I would love to do some, some more weird stuff too, because we don't get that, we don't get to do that very often. You mentioned that you joined the choir in 2011 when you returned to Houston after your uh, master's degree at the New England Conservatory, which was in contemporary improvisation. That's correct. What does that mean? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, the program is surprisingly old. Uh, my mother went to NEC for what was known at the time as the third stream. Uh, oh, it was really? sort of conceived of in the 80s as the personal style that results from the combining of two stylistic streams, and at, and at the time, um, pretty much all that they were thinking of then was jazz and classical, because NEC right. has the oldest jazz program in the country, um, and there was a classical music department there, obviously, as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are more streams. Uh, the things that I studied there with the eye to, uh, not assimilating, but incorporating enough fluency in them to be able to be influenced by them in my personal style of improvisation were uh, Hindustani classical music and Appalachian folk mm -hmm. and Eastern European Jewish music mm -hmm. and Brazilian shoro and Queen. <laughs> so just throw that one in for good measure. Well basically the idea was that you could study whatever you could find in, a, a, whatever idiom you could find an expert in that right. you liked um, and use that for whatever you were trying to accomplish as an improviser. And people don't necessarily know what free improvisation there is besides jazz, um, but there is a lot. My master's recital was quite a gamut. I did Led Zeppelin, Dazed and Confused as a Chacon, because it is one. Um, I did some sort of collaborations with some pianists who were uh, fluent in the sort of wrong note Russian concerto style improvisation. And we did some, some bombastic Russian style free improv. Um, there was a Brazilian pianist there at the same time as I was, who just, uh, he's such a genius. His name's Enrique Eisenman, and I still look at everything that he does because he's complete master of the mm. keys. Um, and I got to do some slightly Brazilian influenced improvisations with him. Um, and by my second year in the program, there were two other singers. I was the only singer in the program for my first year. Uh, mm -hmm. But I got to do some improvised vocal ensemble things on my master's recital with them, which there's so much fun to be had with singers who are familiar with an idiom trying to conform to it together with completely unplanned musical ideas. Um, we improvised a madrigal, basically, um, on the text of Jabberwocky, the Lewis Carroll poem. Um, and it went so well. I, I'm still impressed when I listen to that recording. We had so much fun. Um, 
but I had already been uh, sort of going that direction for vocal improvisation um, in, in ensembles uh, since maybe early college um, because even though I was in the classical improvisation, well, I co-founded the classical improvisation club at HSPBA when I was there with some friends. I wasn't. That's the high school for the performing and visual arts here in Houston. Yes. yes. Two or three friends and I um, were mentored by uh, the amazing composer and pianist Robert Avalon. Uh, so we had improvisation and composition club and we learned so much from him and it was amazing um, but there weren't any other singers in that club so uh, when I was in college a friend of mine Jacob Barton who is an amazing composer um, introduced me to the microtonal scene and particularly just intonation um, and he would have like basically a little summer camp at his apartment and we would improvise uh, even the instrumentalists, we would all be singing um, to sort of internalize the different divisions of the octave. Um, and we would improvise little vocal exercises and ensemble pieces um, from early college and through college. And then so when some other singers arrived um, at New England Conservatory, I was thrilled to be able to do similar things with them. Um, and I do miss that very much, but I've sort of been trying to do it by myself since then, um, because right. one of the other things that I got good at in grad school was multi-tracking. Um, so I did a lot of very complex vocal arrangements that only involve me. Um, and that includes a significant amount of improvised material. So tell us about, is it Ryan Sonora? Yeah, there's no real canonical pronunciation. You can say Ryan Sonora, you can say Rion Sonora. Um, that's the name under which I publish the work that I do by myself. So there are, are four, I can't believe there are four albums that I published last year, but what else was I going to do? Um, <laughs> During the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're all very different. So I can't say that there's a style that Rian Sonora represents. Um, the first one is a bunch of what I like to call fake Renaissance songs. They're not from fake the Renaissance. Renaissance. Yeah, right. uh, I wrote them. So obviously they're not by Renaissance composers, but some right. of them are in the style of Renaissance composers and others are in the style of something that you would hear at a Renaissance fair. So not Renaissance music but renaissance -y music. Um, Popular culture renaissance. Yeah, they're folky basically. Um, right. Especially since I don't have a lute on me, so I played everything on the mandolin. Um, and the second one is real renaissance music. I called it old songs for summer because it was summer and they were old songs. Um, just a bunch of renaissance pieces that were enough parts to be interesting, um, but either uh, a narrow enough range spread that I could sing them all, or I would play the bass line on the cello. Um, and I did a little EP, I guess you'd say. There's only three songs on it, um, a little album called Songs from the Path, because I was so inspired by both the content of and the soundtrack for the Witcher TV show on Netflix that came out uh, last December. Okay or December before last, I guess. Um, so those are also uh, hard to pin down by genre, but they're inspired by a fantasy story. Uh, and then the last one was the one that I've been thinking about and, and, and needing to do for the entire year, basically. Um, and it's called Gloriantic Luciferous and it's all improvised, um, a full album. And it started because uh, my best friend, who I mentioned before, he was one of the ones who founded the improvisation club with me. Uh, my best friend, Reggie, learned photography over the last couple of years. And he took, I was his guinea pig. So he took a bunch of pictures of me in a parking garage and they turned out looking so cool and so weird and like an album cover for 
some weird 70s cult album that I decided to write an album around it, basically. Um, and I, I, I looked at a, at a picture that he had taken for every piece and improvised about how it made me feel. Um, and I needed catharsis last year, as I imagine everyone must have, still does probably. Um, and it just, it was, it was such a, a complete flail into the void of, of feelings that I was having that I did end up improvising, um, overdubbing, multi-tracking, just me a bunch of times in a row, building the arrangement um, according to what I had done before. So it becomes less and less improvisatory the more, um, the more you stack on top of what you do first. Right. But mm -hmm. it was just so extremely important to have that kind of outlet. Um, and I hadn't done all that much um, vocal ensemble in particular, but even just personal improvisation work since 2011, because there isn't a right. lot of call for that in most of the musical output that I participate in here. Um, and it was, it was so freeing and it was so, yeah, I just really got to come back to cathartic. Um, it was a, a very deep expression of what I was going through um, and what I felt everybody was going through. Um, and it was also weirdly isolating because it wasn't an ensemble. It was only me was and, mm -hmm. and it was, it exacerbated whatever feeling I was having about what was going on. But I think it was very important for me to do it by myself. And I, I think it came out um, expressing what I meant to express and how I was feeling um it still occasionally feel and i think it sounds good also it's it i think it's intelligible uh in a way that i hoped it would be to mm -hmm. people who aren't me um and somebody else must think so too because some uh the producer of a a midnight radio show on bbc radio 3 contacted me asking if they could play the opening track from it on Radio oh, 3, wow. and they did on the 3rd. So that was pretty exciting. Yeah, Radio 3 in Britain's big. Yeah. So what is the um, overlay or confluence of your um, improvisational work with what you do with the chamber choir? So How much of it has intersect? to So much of it has to do with listening. Um, there is no ensemble improvisation without just a complete dedication to ensemble, um, which is also just the paragon of priorities in ensemble singing. If you're not with everybody else, it doesn't work. You can't accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And right. since that kind of work is my favorite thing to do and, and pretty much my biggest priority in, in music. Um, I don't wanna be a soloist. I didn't go for a solo career for that reason. I, d I don't wanna be in charge of something. I want to be involved in it. And mm -hmm. when you are improvising collaboratively, it doesn't work if you don't listen to each other. And if you are singing together it doesn't work if you don't listen to each other um right i think i said this before but it, it does feel like a kind of musical communion and this is like the closest that i ever get to actual philosophical spirituality um it's just so deeply felt when it's going right and when you're good at it and when they're good at it and when you're all good at it together it turns into something that is just impossible to replicate in any other context. It's just completely Greater than overwhelming. Some of its parts. Yes. Yeah. So it must have been great for you working with uh, Kim Nazarian when she. Came oh yeah. Yeah. Um, with the choir. 
she was a joy to work with, partially because I am familiar with her idiom and, and partially because she's just so fun and chill. And she has a very clear and low stakes ways of explaining to classical musicians how to do non-classical things. And it was so fun to see her gift that to the chamber choir in a in a laid back and low stakes way so that nobody freaked out about how they were doing it wrong because that is also a thing that it's possible to accidentally do to classical singers. Um, <laughs> but she's, she's just a gem of a human being and a beautiful singer and most important in the context that we had her in, she was so generous with her tradition. Um, and it, it was just overall a lovely experience. I'd love to work with her again. Because I think people perhaps don't always re remember that the Houston Chamber Choir has a, a tremendous commitment to jazz. I mean, you yes. mentioned Christian McBride, Kim Nazarian, Dave Brubeck. Yeah, I wasn't in for that, but that must have been a trip. You also, a little bird has told me, enjoy creative anachronism. Oh, that's true. Yes, I do. Uh, what, what is that? The Society that for Creative mm -hmm. Anachronism is a history club, to put it as short as I can, uh, right. spans the world and the premise is that one pursues the dream of history as it should have been instead of as it was. So I do as much as I can, uh, less now than in previous years, but uh, one of the things that I like to do in the SCA um, is chivalric heavy armored fighting, where I wear, um, heavy armor and fight other people with rattan swords and i have a 20 pound chainmail shirt but i don't usually wear that for actual combat because i am not particularly agile in it yet if i practice more than i might be <laughs> uh but yeah i i do uh, I'm a part of the Bardic Guild of the Barony of Stargate, which is what Houston is called uh, because of NASA, which I think is very clever. I'm glad that they did that. Oh, yes. um, I do manuscript illumination and calligraphy for oh. the Bardic Guild. Um, and I do some heavy fighting when I can, although I haven't been able to in a long time. And what's your name? What's the name of your persona? Do you have one? Yeah, um, Rain is my first name because it's easy to remember because it's spelled with the same letters as my name. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Sholes is the Middle English for it, for my surname, uh, but it just means shoeless because I like to not wear shoes. <laughs> I had a colleague um, several years ago, many years ago, who was a member of the uh, SCA and she made all of her own um, costume. Oh yes, I do would, that as well. She, I remember she would bring in pieces of bone, and she would she would um, shape uh, and sculpt and whittle these pieces of bone to make fasteners for yeah. for the uh, the dresses that she made for herself. Did she make her because own bone needles? Um, that I don't remember. I yeah. do remember that 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 the the commitment to things being as historically accurate mm -hmm. as, as they could be was absolutely phenomenal. The amount of research that can go into period practice reproduction is yes, phenomenal. Um, and I participate as much as I can, but I have learned about period practice for how the manuscripts were painted what pigments were used, how you squished them, what Balmerabic proportions you mixed to make them paint. Um, I mean, I'm also just interested in medieval and Renaissance history in general. Um, and 
that is a significant overlap because I am also deeply invested in medieval and Renaissance music. So I have actually written music that is in period style. Um, I haven't done a whole lot with it in the SCA because I hardly ever have time to go to SCA events because I am a singer and singers work on weekends and evenings, which is when yes, they, do. Right. they have events. Uh, but I'd love to do more. I'd love to get into Bardic, which is what the musical practice and competition events are called. Um, but instead, I wrote an album of fake Renaissance music and I haven't done any of it at the SCA. So if you could come back at any time in history, would you come back as a uh, somebody during the medieval times? That's always a dangerous question. Um, probably not, because there was so much else going on besides the history that I'm interested in. Um, if we're eliminating Bubonic bigotry plagues. and plagues, <laughs> then sure. Right. Uh, I, I find the philosophical and social underpinnings of the feudal system extremely interesting. Like that worked for a very long time um, and, you know, it wasn't necessarily good, but, you know, is it good now? Who knows? Uh, there's so much emotional content to the hierarchy that I think is disregarded by observers from later history that mm -hmm. is very weird to think about. Like you you felt a, when it was working right, which obviously, when does the system ever work right? But if it did, you were deeply invested in the relationship that you had to your feudal lord and your feudal underlings if you were on top of the hierarchy um, and you had a responsibility to each other and it wasn't just you know, someone is in charge and makes you do things. Uh, I think maybe there's some remnant of that, like extinct human emotion in uh, celebrity culture now. People have these mm -hmm. very strong feelings about people that they don't know, that they admire. Um, and then like maybe half of it is with military hierarchy. Like people are very loyal to their military unit. Um, Although I think that's also probably more circumstantial because you spend so much time with and go through so much with people in the military. And of course, you know, there is that, that um, I, I wouldn't call it a hierarchy, but there is that sense of um, understanding one's place within the context of the chamber choir as well. Oh, yes. There? And all Any of ensemble. the different parts have to, they have to work well together. Yes, um, and that means understanding exactly what your what your role is. Yes, you can't be important in an ensemble unless your part is important. important. You have to be part of what you're doing, and I, I thought about this a lot, obviously. But there's a, there's so much joy in accomplishing that and in staying in your place and in uh even if it's not a flashy place in contributing in this way to even something as subtle as an alto line sometimes um mm -hmm. you it's not the same if you're not there if you're not doing it exactly right and it's extremely rewarding um even if your contribution is subtle I know one of the things that people would say about you, Ryan, is that the color of your hair changes. They say that. Um, it's not especially changeable. Uh, it's pretty much always either brown or a gradient from purple to green root to tip. Uh, the length changes, so mm -hmm. sometimes the roots are longer and there's more brown, um, but it's usually purple, blue, green in that order from the bottom of my hair to the end. 
and I can see uh, we have a little bit of green today. Yes, the green is around and the purple is in the middle. Look, Ryan, it's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you and to uh, you. To, to learn so much about you and the, the breadth and depth of your interests and your creative life. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir as a patron, as a subscriber, as a viewer, as a listener. We really appreciate it. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This is Behind the Music. Join us again next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue making new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org slash give.